Look at my slides there. Can you hear me? Oh, yeah. <laughs> wow, that's loud. Perfect, the clicker works. Okay. All right, welcome everyone. We're so glad that you decided to spend the next hour with us. Um, we're uh, community college champions here and we're gonna be talking about how community colleges lead the way with open education. So hope you're in the right session. How many of you are from community colleges? Okay, so we don't have to do too much education about what a community college is. All right, well, it is my pleasure to be here with this amazing panel. I'm Una Daly, the director of the Community College Consortium for OER. We're part of OE Global. And I'm gonna let my panelists just say hello real quick and we'll get into more in-depth introductions in a moment. Hello and good morning, everyone. I'm Shinza Hernandez. Good morning, I'm Kimberly Carter. I'm Robert Lawson, I'm from Northwest College, and um, I'm an instructional designer here. Great, wonderful. And um, Marina Amini is the executive director of the California Virtual Campus. Um, and unfortunately, she can't join us today, but she sent some pre-recorded videos, so you're gonna hear from her uh, as we proceed through the panel. All right, so for those of you who aren't familiar with CCCOER, we have members across Canada and the United States. We're a community of practice supporting open education, uh, encouraging colleges to develop collaborative and sustainable programs to ensure equitable access and success for our students. So pretty much aligned with the goals of community colleges in general. And we were founded in 2007 and we joined OE Global in 2011. So, and have been very happy as part of OE Global. And if you want to find out more information about becoming a member, please um, take a look um, at that link there that's uh, posted. Um, it's our website, cccoer.org, and then become a member with dashes in between. All right, so what are community colleges and what's our mission? So, you know, I think at the center of our work is equity, diversity, and inclusion, and your institution may uh, word that slightly differently, but we, community colleges were really created to provide education uh, to those who didn't have access to university. So these were the brown and the black people and females, um, students with disabilities. And, and today, still, the larger proportion of our students fall into those um, communities. Um, and it, we're publicly funded, um, providing um, affordable access to pathways. Um, and what we are gonna talk about here is how OER and open pedagogy can help our students to be successful and move into uh, successful careers. Um, and as, as you know, community colleges focus on three major areas. Um, one is, you know, op we call it open access, but you might call it open enrollment. So we accept all students. Uh, you don't have to have a high school certificate to come. You don't have to be English language proficient. We offer uh, many services around getting to college ready. Uh, we also do a lot of workforce development. So that is a big part of the mission of community colleges, and so many students come to us for certificates. And then also completion and transfer. So that is moving on to a four-year college or university to get a bachelor's. And affordability is a big part of that work. All right, now I'm gonna let uh, my uh, panelists introduce themselves and um, share a little bit about themselves and their colleges. Hi again, good morning everybody. My name is Shinta Hernandez and I am the Dean of the Virtual Campus at Montgomery College, which is located in Maryland in the United States. And just for a frame of reference, we are located right outside of Washington DC, the nation's capital. And um, so here, the, the other role that I have is I'm, I'm president of the CCC OER Executive Council. 
and um, Montgomery College is a member of Mar Maryland Online, and Maryland Online is a member of CCC OER, so you have all those connections. Um, I want to share with you a little bit about Montgomery College. I've got, a, a, thank you, Una. Um, we are the largest community college in the state of Maryland, and we are also one of the, um, the most diverse community college in the continental United States. We were recently recognized as that a couple of years ago, and, and part of that is because we're located in one of the most diverse counties in America. And as you see the statistics up there, we've got um, about 43,000 students, both credit and non-credit, from 155 countries. And so just those statistics alone can tell you why in open education, open pedagogy is so important for us, because we have so many students from all walks of life. And so while Montgomery County is an affluent county, we have a lot of pockets of poverty as well. So from an affordability standpoint and an accessibility standpoint, open education is important. But also from the inclusivity standpoint and equity standpoint, it is important. Many of us in this room know that representation matters and open educational resources can help with that to showcase um, contributors in our disciplines from marginalized populations. And so this is why we have done um, so much work in, in, these, in this area over the last several years and um, our faculty and staff uh, have really truly embraced open education at our institution. And then in the next slide, I just wanna share with you just very quickly how open education has evolved at Montgomery College. So again, I mentioned affordability. We talked about that at this conference last yesterday, that that's the initial selling point because that's what makes most sense to students at the start. How can they save money, right? Because $40 here and there adds up because uh, it adds up and they can save money uh, from textbooks if we offer Z degrees. So that was our initial um, uh, start. But over time we recognized though that we wanna take it up a notch. And so we started looking at, um, as a result of being a part of the Achieving the Dream grant, we started looking at um, student success rates and how are students doing in these Z courses compared to students who are not in Z courses, Z standing for zero cost textbooks. And so we, we realized or we saw through the data from being a part of the Achieving the Dream grant that these students are doing um, as well as or better. And then we wanted to take that up a notch again. And I won't go too far into this piece yet because we're going to talk about it in the panel. But we began looking at professional development opportunities for our faculty. And, um, and so with that came uh, some fellowships that I will share with you in a second or later on. Uh, but these fellowships are, are what helps our faculty better understand the importance of open education and open pedagogy. And they really, we provide that support and those resources uh, for our faculty to grow collectively and learn collectively so that they are in the best position to help our students and increase accessibility and equity in education. So with that, I'm gonna hand this over to my panelist colleague. Hi, uh, as I mentioned, my name is uh, Kimberly Carter. I'm an OER resource consultant at Conestoga College in Kitchener, Ontario. And before I get started, I just want to acknowledge that we, I am a settler who lives and works on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, uh, the Haudenosaunee, and neutral peoples. And I take responsibility for being a good ally and uh, learning and taking meaningful actions with my indigenous communities. Conestoga College is one of the fastest growing colleges in Ontario, Canada, southern Ontario, Canada, with campuses in eight cities uh, in Ontario representing 10 academic schools. Uh, we deliver a full range of career-focused education, training, and applied research programs. And as one of the country's top research colleges, Conestoga's applied research activities support student learning while helping area businesses grow, innovate, and improve productivity. Part of my role is to oversee the open learning area in library and learning services, where we support faculty, faculty partnerships, some with industry, and learners in the adoption, adaptation, and collaborative new creation of open projects uh, by advocating for release time, wraparound supports, and subsequently providing free resources and development opportunities for those that might not otherwise have an opportunity to do so. That can include students and faculty who may have not traditionally had that opportunity. 
Uh, I can tell you that we're fairly new and emerging. Sometimes I liken it to running a startup. <laughs> so we have 26 OER projects published in our gallery, and 25 of those have been since 2020. Uh, we take an agile project manage approach as we sort of figure out how we're going to continue to offer the supports as it's gaining in popularity. Uh, those types of projects are arranged from digital textbooks, simulations, game simulations, instructional resources, and our open access teaching case journal. I'm just going to put a shameless plug in. At 2.30, we have, uh, we're showcasing uh, industry partnership with us, as well as our open access teaching case journal at 3.45. But how I came to open was through the eCampus Ontario Extend program. And from there, I had taught for many years in a health office administration program where some of our, our textbooks were amongst the most expensive because we were a bit health and we were a bit business and nothing ever really worked. And so all the stars aligned and I heard about open. And a student was out there and she was talking about deciding between textbooks in her children's sports. And I was like, mm, I'm gonna do something about this. And so it's just been so exciting to see how many people have been come interested in this since we were able to advocate and have the support of our senior leadership. So we have a top-down and a bottom-up approach. And currently we have 15 active projects with 25 awaiting in the pipeline. Great. I'm actually from the Kitchener-Waterloo area, so I know Conestoga College well. And um, yeah, my name is Robert Lawson, and I'm an instructional designer at Norquest. Um, I would say about seven years ago, I started to get more and more interested in open education and the possibilities that it had to support our students. So at Norquest College, a lot of our students, probably more than 50%, are new Canadians. Um, I would say we have students from over a hundred countries uh, speaking over 70 languages. So it's a very, very diverse group. Uh, we also have a very large indigenous student population. And um, so really equity, diversity and inclusion are uh, really a part of our DNA. It's, it's extremely important at our college. And we offer um, a wide breadth of different programs. We have over 12,000 full-time students. Um, we offer programs in, uh, you know, healthcare aid, um, nursing. We have a business program, um, so a pharmacy tech program, uh, um, ESL, and uh, Link. Language instruction for newcomers to Canada is very important. We also have upgrading for students uh, who need to upgrade their high school uh, credentials. So it's really a, a diversity of programs um, designed to support students who are new uh, Canadians or um, perhaps coming back to the education system after, after leaving it for a few years. So. Um, I'm not sure if we have the, yeah, I just wanted to briefly um, review these two documents. So um, you can see our strategic plan on the left. The title of it is, We Are Who We Include. So this really is what Norquest is all about. It's all about inclusion. Um, we recognize the diversity of our students. Uh, we recognize the importance of developing materials that meet the needs of our diverse student population, and so we are who we include. Um, I don't think there could be a better name for a strategic plan for Norquest. And um, if you look on the right there, it says reimagine higher education. And this was an initiative that we started about four years ago, three or four years ago, and it was designed to envision where Norquest would be in um, 10 years. So. Uh, I guess that's about seven years now. But um, it was a very ambitious plan. Uh, included in this plan was um, our open educational resource plan. We wanted to begin by publishing three books a year through the Open Education Alberta textbook publishing platform, Pressbooks. And um, we're meeting this target. 
and um, we also wanted to uh, experiment with open pedagogy, and there have been some initiatives around that. And um, uh, we also planned, you, you won't believe this, but we planned to host OE Global. This was uh, something that we envisioned in 2020, but we didn't envision it that happening until like 2027 or 2028, and here we are. So um, that's pretty amazing. Um, so yeah, that's... Um, that's just sort of an overview of, of uh, our strate st strategic plans. And um, this uh, image here uh, represents the, the skills of distinction. And this is the new approach that we're taking to college-wide learning outcomes. So prior to this, we had a series of statements that were written like, uh, you know, well-written learning outcomes with a measurable verb and um, something about context and possibly performance as well. And we decided we wanted to do something a little different, so we, we adopted the medicine wheel and um, this uh, circle of courage, which was developed by Dr. Martin Brokenleg. And we've adapted this to reflect what it is that we want learners to come away with at the end of their time at Norquest. Uh, we want them to be inclusive, um, we want them to be resilient, and we want them to practice new ways of thinking. And um, within that uh, circle, uh, there's, there's some other characteristics or some other words inside of the medicine circle. So we want to s them to reflect on, you know, how they're being inclusive with respect to belonging, generosity, Etc. So, it's um, it's a, it's really a new approach, and I think it um, it emphasizes the importance of indigenization at the college. So, thank you to all our panelists. Um, that was very thoughtful, and I learned some new things. I hope that you all did too. Um, and I love the idea of the medicine wheel. What an interesting approach to take. Uh, and that may be more approachable also for students than um, some of our other statements that we make. So at this point, we do want to share with you a few words from uh, Dr. Marina Amini, who is the, um, thank you, <laughs> she's the executive director, I know her quite well, <laughs> of the California Virtual Campus, but of course when you get up here you forget everything. So, um, so Reese, if we could play her video, please. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Marina Amini. I'm the executive director for the California Virtual Campus. And I apologize for not being there in person at what looks to be an amazing conference this week, so I hope you enjoy it. So a little bit about the state of California and what I do. The California Community Colleges are the world's largest educational system. We're comprised of about 115 colleges in 72 districts. So some are multi-colleges and some are single college districts and we serve between 1.8 to 2.2 million students annually. And so the role of community colleges in the state of California is tremendous. We have one in every region, in every city virtually, and uh, pretty much every citizen in the state has taken a class either as an undergraduate, uh, as a continuing education student, or maybe as a senior, as a lifelong learner in our emeritus programs, but the community colleges are truly a part of the community that's in their name. And so when we have an initiative that touches our students and touches the California Community Colleges, it's tremendously impactful. And one policy or one initiative can really have rippling effects for student success and student support. And so the OER initiative and project in our state has been tremendous and it has made some tremendous headway through the community colleges. For me personally, when I was a college student, I didn't always purchase my textbook because I couldn't afford it. So there were times when I took entire classes as an undergraduate without buying a textbook. Sometimes I would buy the book but copy select chapters based on what was in the syllabus and then return the book so that I didn't have to pay for it. And other times I would team up with my classmates to split the cost of a book. And I know that our students are doing the same thing when they cannot afford textbooks. And so for me, it's not only a professional passion, but a personal passion as well, because I remember those days and I remember what it's like for our students. And I'm looking forward to this conversation today to talk a bit about the California Virtual Campus as well. We, my organization, the California Virtual Campus, 
we essentially allow for cross-enrollment between 115 colleges. So imagine being a student at one of those colleges and not having the courses that you need, or maybe the courses that you need are offered by your institution, but they're very expensive in terms of the textbook costs. You can now use the California Virtual Campus, the exchange, to go and find a course at any of the other colleges and within a matter of minutes add those classes. And furthermore, we mark those classes for zero textbook cost. So really it's a matter of putting the decisions and the selection at the hands of our students, the consumer. And the more information and education we put in the hands of our students, what we have found is the more successful they are. So with that, I will hand it back to Una. Thank you. All right. Another perspective from a statewide um, community college system. And these are some slides from um, Mar Marina, but we're gonna skip past those at this point. And we're gonna go to our panel now for just some um, questions. Um, and um, so um, tell us about what unique strategies your college utilizes to support equitable outcomes for diverse students through open ed. And who would like to start? Thank you, Shinta. Absolutely, thank you for that question, Una. Um, so earlier in, my, in one of my slides, I had talked about um, affordability as that initial starting point for our students. I wanted to also share that through the Achieving the Dream grant, we had saved more than $13 million since we started it. And we have course marking, which allows us to capture that data. But one, and so we have several unique strategies that we employ at Montgomery College to help diverse uh, student populations by way of open education. But the one that I would like to focus here are the fellowships, and I, that was on the, the, the right-hand side of my slide. The, interestingly enough, Dr. Cable Green, our keynote speaker, talked about the UN SDGs, and that if we wanna solve the world's biggest problems, that we have to make uh, the information and the culture and the knowledge open. And so my colleague, Dr. Mike Mills, who's in the audience, he's vice president of e-learning, innovation, and teaching excellence at Montgomery College. He and I were attending uh, the Open Ed Conference in Anaheim 2017, I believe it was, and we went to Dr. Green's session on UN SDGs, had a conversation, thought about some of the, the things that um, he had said in his session, and we thought about how, how can we couple the idea of the UN SDGs with open education? And so we, after a lot of conversations, we went back to Montgomery College, and before you know it, this United Nations Sustainable Development Goals Open Pedagogy Faculty Fellowship was born. And so that's one of the unique strategies that I will um, really discuss, because in just these past six years, this international partnership has spanned across 12 institutional partners, um, across North America, Central America, and now Asia. We just opened up an Asia chapter. And we're, we're looking and, and, and people are interested in um, being a part of this uh, collaboration. And in fact, just a shameless plug, tomorrow at morning, 11.30, we're, uh, several of us on the leadership team are gonna present on how to lead and sustain an international collaboration. So feel free to, to stop by if, if your schedule permits. Um, but we, what's really essential about this, this collaboration, this fellowship, is that the faculty who are selected to be a part of this fellowship across the partners, um, they become a part of a faculty team that is cross-institutional and multidisciplinary. So if you're a sociology professor at Montgomery College, for example, you might be paired up with someone who's from Kwantlen Polytechnic University in, in British Columbia in biology. And so they come up with, this team would come up with these interdisciplinary renewable assignments that put their students at the center of change. Their students become change agents in their communities by way of these UN SDGs. And so in the last six years, we have seen some remarkable assignments that these faculty teams have developed and even more remarkable student projects that truly have made an impact on our societies, our global societies. And so we, um, in fact, actually a couple years ago, 2020, I believe it was, Open Education Global awarded us with the uh, uh, Open Education Award of Excellence. And so we're certainly very grateful for that. And it just continues to grow. And from that, Another unique strategy is that we continue to th consider other additional professional development opportunities for our faculty 
um, centered around open pedagogy. And the most recent one was just launched this summer, eFaculty Fellowship for Dual Enrollment. And so there's a couple of uh, facets of that fellowship. One is open pedagogy, another one is virtual environments. But this touches on dual enrollment students. And so we're really excited about having launched that, and we'll see where that goes in the years to come. But um, we're very, just like many of you in this room, very big on improving relevance of our faculty and creating more and more robust professional development opportunities. Thank you, Shinta. Uh, at Conestoga and Open Learning, um, at Conestoga we have a really uh, interesting co-op um, and work study program. And so in open learning, uh, we encourage um, students, and many of them are from our international, we have a very diverse international student population, and these students are compensated through work study and paid co-op terms. Uh, so we provide a practical opportunity for them to co-construct and work uh, with our faculty members in developing OER. Now, not every project, um, but a couple examples. In one, we put a call out to um, our students to act in our game simulation videos so that within their um, the game simulations, the student population is, is pretty well represented. Um, and then they also gain some really practical work experience uh, that they can then apply to uh, their CVs and sometimes have opportunity to industry partners uh, to demonstrate their skills and build those relationships and those communities. Uh, learners um, also have, for some of our open projects, evaluated uh, the material. So I'll give you one example that always sticks with me because when we first start doing that, they're not too sure, right? Like you really want us to peer review this from the student view. I'm like, yes, I want to imagine you're a brand new student, you're looking at this material for this first time, what's, what's wrong with it, what's, what's not speaking to you? And one student very said, well, if you're sure, there's way too many words. And I said, of course, we're educators, we talk way too much. Um, but that was such a, like, an enlightening moment that sh we took time to build that trust with her. And so I think that that's a very important strategy. And we try to bring that when we're speaking to our faculty developers, that co-construction with students and how important that is uh, to make sure their voices and their images are represented in our open projects. I love the idea of co-creating with students because I think that does promote equity, diversity, and inclusion if they can see themselves in the, the works that they're co-creating, so that's great. And we'd love to um, initiate some open pedagogy um, projects. That's, um, that's coming, it's being done on a small scale, but uh, hopefully there will come a day in the next year or so where uh, somebody decides to enlist the, the help of their students to help develop or maybe even uh, redevelop uh, an existing textbook that can actually reflect uh, who our students are and what their needs are. So at, at Norquest, um, everything that we've done in terms of open education has kind of been guided by the overall strategic plan that I mentioned we are who we include, in which there is a, a statement that uh, mentions that Norquest is dedicated to becoming an anti-racist institution, uh, one that uh, emphasizes decolonization, and um, one that will support the unique um, needs of our, our student population. So if you look at the textbooks that we've published so far, they, um, they do align with the unique needs of our, our students. We do have a, a very popular textbook in settlement studies, and settlement studies is a, um, uh, a bit of a unique program at Norquest. And um, this textbook also uh, traces the history of oppression in Canada, um, the oppression of minorities and indigenous peoples. So, I think that's uh, a very important thing for Canadians and particularly new Canadians to understand as they adjust to uh, a life in this country. Um, we've also developed some, uh, uh, some resources for our, 
our English learners. Uh, for example, we have a textbook on um, digital literacy for the, the, um, the newcomers to Canada, for the, the ones in the LINK program. So our textbooks really reflect our attempt to be more inclusive. And um, once the, um, the textbooks are developed, they undergo a pretty rigorous peer review. And that's not only a peer review that looks at uh, the content and the academic merit, but it also investigates you know, the, the extent to which the, um, the textbook is meeting the needs of, uh, in terms of accessibility of people who may not um, for example, people who may be colorblind or facing other challenges, uh, people with disabilities. Uh, so that, that disability checklist is a very important component um, of ensuring that we're meeting the needs of all students. Um, we also have an EDI rubric that we use to assess uh, all of our textbooks and make sure that it's as inclusive as possible. We encourage authors to think about the images that they're using. Um, the language that they're using, um, et cetera. It's a pretty comprehensive rubric. So those are some of the, the most prominent initiatives that we're taking in terms of EDI right now. Wonderful. Um, thank you for that. Um, yeah, particularly for sharing about the EDI rubrics. And I know that um, pretty much all of our um, developers of OER have EDI rubrics. I'm, let's go ahead and play um, the video number two from Marina. But I want to say, um, while you're listening to that, you might be thinking about um, what strategies your college utilizes, because we're going to turn to you after we hear from Marina and ask you to share, if you'd like to. Well, let's talk about unique strategies when it comes to implementing and growing OER for our diverse students. I would say there have always been some fledgling initiatives and projects at the California Community Colleges, but that work became very serious in 2015 when uh, Assembly Bill 798 was passed called the College Textbook Affordability Act, and later in 2018, uh, Assembly Bill 1809, which put aside about $6 million for faculty and staff and colleges to really utilize uh, grant money to grow their initiatives around OER adoption. Uh, several years ago, we had a law that required California community colleges to clearly highlight using a symbol or logo in our course schedule whether a class uses exclusively digital course materials. So we had to tell students when, at the point of the course schedule whether a course was zero textbook costs and OER, or whether there was actually a physical book that required money. This was a major game changer. And what colleges immediately noticed was that those courses that were marked for zero textbook costs, those courses filled more quickly. They had fewer canceled sections. And over time, they were able to see that the outcomes for those courses were significantly better than the outcomes for like courses that required paid textbooks and physical materials. So there were some very exciting findings that led to a number of additional initiatives through the California Chancellor's Office, the California Community Colleges Chancellor's Office, that included grant programs that allowed colleges to really lay out their vision for increasing OER adoption that really allowed people to move it. Um, when I was a dean at one of those colleges, because of these grant programs, we were able to move our college from about 5% OER ZTC to about 60% over five years. Uh, and we're talking of thousands of courses and sections, hundreds of faculty that moved their courses. And it was really through a stipend program. And many, many colleges ended up using this strategy. Um, and additionally, there were other ed code that really appropriated money for not just zero textbook uh, classes, but then pathways and entire degrees. So then you had colleges like my former college also utilizing these grant monies to create entire degrees and certificates and transfer patterns that were zero textbook costs and really focusing on sustainability of those programs after the grant funding was exhausted. So those are some strategies that we've used in our system. At the California Community College's virtual campus, which is where I work, um, we have also through that cross enrollment process uh, marked our ZTC courses very clearly for students. Students can now go in and search for and take courses that are badged 
with zero textbook costs. And again, what we're finding is that there's tremendous demand and interest and students now recognize what that means and they eagerly and excitedly seek out those courses as options for completing their educational goals. So I'll stop here and hand it back to Una. All right, and so she mentioned funding, which is, uh, yeah, kind of the elephant in the room. Uh, this, this uh, even though open educational resources are free to use, I think somebody on the first day said they're not free to develop. So really important part, and also of letting students know how they can find the courses that use that. Okay, now it's, um, it's, it's your turn if you'd like to um, share uh, strategies that your college is using. Would, would anyone like to share? Uh, okay. Yeah, sorry, it's hard to see out there, please. Uh. And, and maybe tell us what college you're at as well. Okay, I'm super loud, so <laughs> I'm gonna tone it down for this. Um, I'm actually from Arkansas in the US. Uh, we're down in the southern part. And we lead Arkansas in OER usage. Um, I, I work at a community college and we're a part of the University of Arkansas system. There's 22 community colleges, but we're very innovative. So we're 71% OER, uh, which, which is quite remarkable where we're at. Um, and the way, the way we started was in 2015, previous to my current role, I had worked in the college bookstore. And in 2015, the chancellor approached me and said, hey, our lease is up with our bookstore. Relinda, can you develop a textbook program? You know, an, an internal program. And I said, I don't know, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna give it a shot. Um, I did. I spent four months ordering books from places like Amazon. For any courses that adopted a book, you know, there might be a hundred books they needed. Well, I would order them one at a time, two at a time, however I could get them until I bought up the market. Because of that, we were able to rent these textbooks to our students for $30 a semester. Um, and then at the same time, we were pushing OER, an OER initiative. So to date, we've saved our students $3.2 million. Now we're a small college, uh, about 1,500 students. Um, so, you know, we're pretty proud of that. Uh, but what we're running into now, and this, and this is what I really wanted to ask someone here, the, the best way, uh, I think a lot of people here are very experienced with this, and there are some states in the U.S. where we're not supposed to say diversity, equity, or inclusion. And that is what our OER is founded upon. In fact, we're, we're the only HSI institute in the state of Arkansas. Um, so, you know, we're very based in diversity, but the state funds us. So if we have any kind of programs that are centered on diversity, equity, or inclusion, we can lose our state funding. Mm -hmm. So I'm kind of wondering if uh, anyone has any innovative ways on how to handle that? Thank you for that question. Um, and certainly you're not unique. There's other states in the US where um, there's been recent legislation um, where you're not allowed to use those terms. Um, all right, we've got someone over here. Would you like to help um, her out with that? <laughs> or did you have a separate question? <laughs> or separate? I'm Liz Pierce, I'm from um, Oregon in the United States, a community college, and I was gonna answer your question, if that's <laughs> okay. still all right. Yeah, yeah, just, just hold on, yeah. We, I know that we, we are looking for alternative um, terminology, and I don't know if you specifically can't say diversity, equity, inclusion together. Sometimes you're allowed to use one of those terms, but not all of them together. That, what all together seems to be, uh, it's, it's kind of a red flag um, in some states. Um, you definitely, yes, definitely, you could talk about that. We know, though, that socioeconomic alone does not account for 
um, the discrimination that occurs. But yes, you do. Yes, it's, it's kind of a, a piece, of, it's definitely a piece of it. Thank you for that. We'll have to talk later. I, I, I'd love to hear more. Are you at Southeastern? No. Which one are you at? Which community college? Cossatock Community College. Oh, Cossatock. Okay. Yeah. Well, we should talk more. Th thank you for sharing that. Um, yes, and please, go ahead. Um, yeah, so I was going to talk a little bit about an um, interdisciplinary project that we're doing at Lynn Benton Community College. Myself, I'm teaching human development and a sciences faculty. And our, both of our classes are focused on um, difference, power, and oppression. And we are still allowed to use those words. In fact, we're encouraged to. Um, but what I wanted to say about that, we've developed some open pedagogy assignments. And, and Dr. Hernandez, I'm so interested in, in learning more about what you're doing on a larger scale, I think, than what we're doing. But those final projects where students are focused on social justice and environmental justice, what's so powerful is the students that have been underrepresented and have lived experience and now have integrated some of the academic terminology around environmental justice and social justice, um, they really can speak their truth in a more powerful way. And so those final assignments, which um, can go, some have gone into a, a textbook that I had written with students, so some are in the textbook now, and some are now going into an, an openly licensed environmental justice um, anthology. And it's been powerful for all the students, but I would say for underrepresented students, especially powerful. That's wonderful, and thank you. I know that Oregon is doing a lot of work in this area, and it's very impressive. Um, yeah, so thank you for sharing that. Do we have others who would like to share? <laughs> okay, well, we'll have, we'll have a chance at the end if we, if we don't run out of time and we don't get overrun with the lunch crowd. All right, We're, this is our final question to our panelists. Um, any lessons learned that um, at your college about trying to implement these. Uh, sometimes we do run into uh, barriers, and um, certainly um, this educator here from Arkansas shared with us, um, you know, they've been going strong since 2015, but now they're running into some political issues that are making it difficult to, to move forward. Um, so, panelists, would you like to share? Yeah, um, so, uh Lessons learned, yeah. So I guess um, some of the lessons that we've learned is, um, you know, we can we can really try to be as um, stringent as possible in terms of peer reviewing our our books, but um, it's not always perfect. And um, we um, recently had an audit at um, Norquest that looked at accessibility in terms of our online courses. Um, and we use the, the Moodle uh, learning management system. And it, um, it, it wasn't uh, overly positive, And it really made a lot of people think about how we're designing our online courses. You know, um, we, um, we took a look at them and from the perspective of someone who is using a screen reader. and. You know, some of the stuff that uh, we had in our courses was not not readable, and um, it uh, really makes you think when you experience it from that perspective. You know, actually using a screen reader and experiencing the challenges that somebody else might have using those materials, and it really made us think that um, we need to to do this, the same thing with the open educational resources that we're developing in press books we need to do a much more thorough accessibility audit. We need to make sure that the tables are formatted properly so that they can be read by a screen reader. Uh, we need to make sure we have alt tags for all of our images. And um, we've started to do that. We've started to go back based on the findings of this, um, this audit uh, of our online courses. We started to use some of the conclusions from that 
to go back and take a look at our press books and see what, what it is that we're missing in terms of accessibility. And um, yeah, we, I think we have quite a bit of work to bring those up to standard. So I think it's, it's something that um, in the beginning we were very excited about publishing open textbooks and um, I think if we had considered this from the very beginning it would have made the job much easier to create these resources. So uh, that was a bit of a, a hard lesson and um, I think just uh, um, I, wa I want to say something just a little bit different but um, I think that uh, planning this um, conference for the last year at Norquest um, has uh, really been a wonderful challenge, but um, there have been some uh, lessons learned along the way. Um, so the way that we, we approach this, uh, the, the conference development, is that we wanted to create something that was a partnership with the Indigenous House of Learning. Um, and we envisioned this as something that could, could somehow advance reconciliation in Canada um, in, you know, even in a small way. Um, but there were a lot, of, uh, a, large, a lot of hard lessons along the way to being more inclusive in our approach to conference design. Um, some challenges around protocol coming from a Western background. Uh, I, didn't, uh, I didn't have an idea about some of the, the protocols that I needed to follow. Um, with our, our Cree relatives. And that led to a few bumps in the road. You know, for example, if you, if you ask somebody to, for their knowledge, um, then you need to acknowledge that and that person becomes a part of your, your relations, a part of your circle. Um, and I sort of moved on and asked another person to check this. And this other person uh, who, uh, was Indigenous felt excluded from that and uh, so it really made me reflect and think about what I'm doing in terms of promoting inclusivity and how I'm going about it and it's not always an easy road to follow. Uh, there's going to be moments where you have missteps and uh, there will be bumps in the road but I think ultimately uh, what we came together and developed was pretty special. Uh, because of the, the cooperation and collaboration between uh, Indigenous and non-Indigenous relatives, so, yeah. And I don't know, as a participant of this conference, can I just say it, it feels like you did a really good job. <laughs> you know how everyone's feeling in the um, audience. Lessons learned, wow, there has been tons. So from a very uh, practical perspective, we didn't know what we didn't know when we started. And uh, so recently hired uh, editor, instructional designer slash editor from the publishing world. And when she started to look at what we had done in the past, it was really apparent that we could have done a better job, but we didn't know what we didn't know. So uh, I think it's like having grace and knowing that you're gonna, the first thing isn't gonna be perfect. And really that's what open is, right? Open's about building upon one thing and then making it better with the next iteration and the next amount of people that repurpose uh, what you have done. So there's that piece. Uh, but recently, uh, reflecting with colleagues who are sitting in this room, one is we don't take time to reflect, right? Always in a rush, always trying to get the next project completed and not um, and feeling like, I can't tell you how many people have said, you know, Kim, you need to slow down. It's gonna take at least 10 years. And I'm like, 10 years? <laughs> might be retired then, not sure, um, or rewired, as Una says. Um, and so sometimes that can be really discouraging, but when you sit back and reflect about where you've been and where you are now, it's like, okay, wow, like things are moving even though there's so many more things to do. So I think that that's an important piece, and we know that's an important piece of learning too, It's to take the time to reflect and time. There's never enough time to do everything you want to do, uh, I was in a session yesterday where it was like, put the, your three most uh, things that are important to you. And I thought, well, energy, where will I put my energy? That's how I prioritize. What's the impact? 
right, and what brings me joy. And so sometimes when you get burdened under that, oh, I need to complete all of these projects and all these things in less than 10 years, um, is just remember, is it joyful, right? And to uh, bring that amongst the people working with you. Great, thank you. Well, I appreciated this question very much when Una first came to us um, in preparation for this panel because it allowed me to, and I'm gonna use Kimberly's words here, reflect on what has Montgomery College done and where can we go? And so I'm gonna approach this question slightly differently but of the same um, context. Uh, where are those areas of, of growth that are still out there to explore and to dive into? And so I have a, a couple that I'd like to share here. Um, so again, kind of referencing back to Dr. Cable Green's um, toward the end of his keynote about artificial intelligence. So that the United Nations Fellowship that I mentioned earlier, one of the things that we would love to explore and really talk about how this is going to pan out is the intersection between artificial intelligence, open pedagogy, and how that plays out with publicly licensed materials. And so as the leadership team continues talking about it, um, we will come next summer when the next cohort comes through, definitely have a good grasp of how that's gonna look like, what that's gonna look like um, for, the, for that cohort. And then the other piece where I think there's an opportunity for growth is in the spirit of equity, taking a look at our non-credit workforce development side, really thinking about how can we offer the space and place and support and resources for non-credit programs, degree certificates, and courses so that those students and those faculty members also get to benefit from the, the work of open education so that we can continue to, we can see benefits and outcomes similar to what we've been seeing on the credit side. And then I meant, um, my colleagues here mentioned students as co-creators. A couple of years ago, we had launched through an internal grant something that we called Social Justice Ambassadors Program in which faculty were paired with students in their courses to co-create materials, the curriculum, and, and group assignments, and other things that would create that more inclusive and more empowering learning experience for the students. And so that's another area of opportunity where we would like to grow at Montgomery College. So on that, I'm gonna hand this back over to Una. Thank you so much uh, to our to our panelists for that and for being really honest about uh, you don't know what you don't know till you get there and um, thank you um, Robert specifically about um, you know the the challenges and and the learning associated with putting together a conference where you are really trying to be two-eyed seeing yeah, yeah. And, I, and I love the programs that you shared. Shinta. Well, we are going to skip Marina, much as we love her, but we are at the end of this. Um, and so I do want to um, welcome you to uh, join our, our free part of our community. J join our community email. We have monthly webinars focused on OER, uh, put on by wonderful practitioners like these. Um, and we have a, a lot of other activities throughout the year. We've got an equity book club in the summer. We've got um, summer conversations, uh, you join OE Global as well, you get your conference discounts, because we are part of OE Global, and that, your membership in CCCOER is with OE Global as well. All right, now we want to open this up for any questions you might want to uh, address to our esteemed panelists. So, this is your time again. Is everyone getting hungry for lunch? Oh, yes, please. So it might have been me. Um, we, yeah, so the, the books that we've been developing, not all of them, but um, uh, some of them are geared towards, um, you know, the, the, the realization that a lot of our students are new Canadians and um, uh, coming to a very different place. So um, we have developed, uh, are, are you familiar with LINK? Language Instruction for Newcomers to Canada? 
It's a government-funded program, and um, we've uh, developed some open resources. Um, in particular, we have one on uh, digital literacy that's available in the Open Education Alberta catalog, uh, because this is really a, a very important skill for um, newcomers to Canada, uh, and for, for language students in particular, so, yeah. Yes, I also wanted to mention that there's a number of textbooks out there uh, that are on ESL um, that are produced. You might, uh, are you familiar with the repositories? Okay, yeah, definitely check those out. I know uh, there's been work done around the country on that. Oregon has some, uh, California does, um, but, but far other states. And, I, I, and thank you for sharing yours as well, Robert. Well, um, we are still open for questions for like another minute. Is that it? <laughs> I'm looking for, yeah, sorry. You have a comment? Yeah, please. Yes, well, thank you. Thank you all so much for joining us. I think we are right up on the lunch hour. And thanks so much to, to the technical team for um, all the hand-holding <laughs> through the videos and so forth. Really appreciate that. <laughs>